2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 through 13. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listen to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. We have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak as to children. Widen your hearts also. Thank you. All right, so 2 Corinthians, as we jump into God's word, um, one of the things we like to do at Redeeming Grace um, because we are dedicated to God, we want to, we want you to experience the life change that comes from knowing God's word and applying it to your life. So that's why we like to explain the Bible verse by verse, every chapter, every book, because um, part of God's family, we want us to be able to experience all the scriptures that we have. And so today we're going through Second Corinthians chapter six, and. The big idea today is a Christian's identity. Um, now, if you've ever done any journaling before, for some of us, journaling doesn't seem like something you'd ever want to do, right? And then for others, journaling is actually pretty exciting. You like to get that pen and a fresh piece of paper and, and go write down your thoughts, write down your feelings, um, Tell what you've been thinking the last few days, the last few weeks, how your relationships have been going, how they haven't been going. How has your dreams in life been going? Have you, are you doing the job that you've always wanted to do, um, right? Are, are, is everything going great in your life or is it going pretty terrible? And that's what journaling is, right? It's a self-reflection. Now, Paul writes quite a few different types of books. Some books are very heavy with encouragement. Some books are very heavy with instructions. Others are very polemical. They're very full of arguments, and he's telling us exactly what not to believe and how to counteract other arguments that are going on. Second Corinthians is actually pretty unique for Paul. He comes across, honestly, in the book, kind of like he is journaling a little bit. It's very personal to him. And there's a couple, there's four different reasons for the entire book of Second Corinthians. Number one is to encourage forgiveness. Now, last book, 1 Corinthians, people were sleeping around and they were encouraging it in the church and Paul shut it down. He said, no, we're not going to do that. You have to kick them out of the church if they're not going to give up that sin. And so they did. They actually gave up their sin after they were kicked out of the church. And then the issue was some people weren't forgiving them of their sins and issues. And so he encouraged them to forgive and to restore, number one. And then another reason, number two, the second reason for the book, is he wanted to explain his change in plans. He was planning on coming back to Corinth, but he didn't end up making it. Well, Back in the day, they didn't have text messages or cell phones. You couldn't just call them or text and say, hey, I'm going to be late. Or, hey, I got detained by the Roman guards. Or, God is sending me to a different city to plant another church in a different city. He couldn't say that. And so a lot of the Corinthian believers were upset and angry that he did not show back up after he had said he was going to. And then number three, he enlisted their help to help with other churches. So... I love this idea of churches helping other churches. 
and someday, some way, I'd like us to see what we can do uh, to be able to do something similar to this. The idea of helping other churches monetarily or in any other way, even praying for them. The church at Jerusalem, kind of the mothership, if you want to call it that, um, was struggling financially. They were under persecution. A bunch of issues were going on with the famine and everything. And so he was trying to get other churches that he had started to make a collection to give to the church. And then number four, establish himself as an authority. Um, what happened is after he planted the church and left, a couple Christians came into the church. They were bad Christians that were either uh, of the Judaistic sect or the Gnostic sect. And they were saying, Paul is not a good person. Don't listen to the guy. Whether or not they were trying to talk about his past life as murdering Christians or the fact that he wasn't part of the original 12 disciples, they were creating division and saying, don't listen to Paul. And so Paul had to establish his authority that it came from Christ. And so that's where we're picking up today. Verse 1, chapter 6. It says, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, this is right off the end of chapter 5. And you have to understand, chapters were not put in there originally. Like Paul didn't say, all right, chapter 6. You know, it's not like how books are written today where there are chapters. This was all one letter. And so a good way to understand this is to see where it's coming from. At the end of chapter 5, verse 20, he says, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. And so, first of all, in his journal of a Christian's identity, our, the first point today is that we Christians are ambassadors. And so he's finishing this thought from chapter 5, the fact that, all of us as Christians, and Paul himself is called by God to be an ambassador. He is going to a foreign country, essentially, as an ambassador for Christ. No other reason that he, like no other person is he an ambassador for. He's not an ambassador for a political leader. He's not an ambassador for his lifestyle, for his job of being a tent maker. He is there for Christ. And, and honestly, this is part of the Christian life that we have to understand that God calls us to an exciting adventure to follow him and be an ambassador wherever we are at in our life. So whatever your job is, whether that's a stay-at-home mom with kids, whether that's a single person dating in a relationship, married, married 15 years, or maybe you're 80 years old or plus, like Moses was, there is different times in our life that God calls us to different jobs, different places, and we have different people that he calls us to be around, and that's part of who we are to be an ambassador to. Be an ambassador to your kids. Be an ambassador to your coworkers. Be an ambassador to Christ, to everyone that you are around. That is part of your calling, and that is part of the adventure that God calls you to. Now, it's not just a job. Sometimes when you hear things like, oh, you know, we as Christians, we are to be ambassadors, we're called. Uh, it sounds kind of like, all right, I got to throw on my Christian hat and act like a Christian today. It's different than that. Verse 1 says, you're not just working for Christ, but you're working with Christ, right? You're working together with him. And that's different, right? Right. As a chaplain, I, I work in the hospice field, and I don't work just for a company. I work with a bunch of people. And so some of my visits, I go into a house with a medical doctor, with a nurse, with a psychologist, and we look at how we can help people holistically, right? Then there's different ways of dealing with that. Melissa and I work together in how we parent our kids, Right? It's not just the Fred show. It's not just Melissa by herself. It's both of us together. And as the church, we work together with one another, working with Christ. That's one of the greatest things we get to do. You don't have to be an ambassador all on your own. You don't have to be an island. You don't have to be alone in what you are called and in your calling. You get to do it life, do life together with us. Do life with us. God himself. You get to work with Christ in your calling. 
And this is part of what God desires us to do. And he's actually quoting here Isaiah chapter 49. He says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, verse 2, and in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So in the Old Testament, Isaiah 49 is referencing this time they were captured in Babylon and they were longing to go back home to their home country and restart Israel 2.0. And now he's saying that this is actually the, the favorable time that was mentioned in the scripture that when Jesus came, the king of kings started his kingdom with the church He's saying, this is what we were talking about in the Old Testament. This is what Isaiah was prophesying about. The day of salvation came because Jesus died on the cross for you and started your life to become a life that you are now an ambassador for God. Now, why does he frame it like this? Favorable time. Now is a favorable time. Um, I think oftentimes as Christians or even as non-Christians, it's very easy to put off your purpose and say, eventually I'll get there. Eventually I'll do, you know, I've always wanted to do this one thing. I've always wanted to follow God. And I think it'd be neat if I eventually get there one day and, you know, I'll kind of maybe sort of plan on it. And and then we'll haphazardly throw it in the back of our filing system in our brain. And then like I do all the time, forget it. I'm great at forgetting things. Um, this is something that, that honestly, we probably don't have that, this mentality um, in our mindset where we think, behold, now is the favorable time. We may honestly think, and we look around us, and we look at America and the current state in 2024 and say, this doesn't seem very favorable. A lot of us as Christians have a, a downward look on, on life in general or, or our culture because it's fallen and sinful, and it's not as great as we think it could be. Instead of that, I believe that if we look at this scripture and take it to heart and think now is a favorable time, now is the favorable time, why is it favorable? Not because of the circumstances in which we live, but because of the Christ that we follow. Our King of Kings is ruling and reigning, and he is desiring us to be his ambassadors to this fallen world. So no matter how bleak the world may seem, we as Christians... We as believers in Christ, because of the day of salvation, the day is favorable. Now, I've talked with people before, and, and they've stated that, you know, I believe that there is a God, and eventually um, I'll give my life to God someday. I'll be sold out to him one day, probably in my 40s and 50s later on in my life. But right now, I want to live it up. Right now, I want to enjoy my life as it is. I want to have the best of both worlds. I want to live and enjoy everything that life can offer right now and have life be all about me. And then eventually, when I die, right before I die, I'll come back to God and believe in him. And then I'll be able to go to heaven for eternity. And I'll get both sides, right? It's going to be perfect. And there is a truth that God can forgive you no matter what wrongs you've done in your life, but you're putting it off. And honestly, it's a, it's a mental state of pride to think that you can trick God like that because God is actually very good at opposing the proud and not allowing you to accomplish your purpose. And so that's why I would say, don't put off repenting of your lifestyle. Don't put off following God and obeying God. Obey God today. Start a new lifestyle in forgiveness and obedience to Christ today. Start your repentance today and continue it moving forward. Today is the favorable day, not tomorrow, not some far off day in the future. The bug. There we go. Ladybug landed on me. Um, Continuing on, back to the scriptures. Verse three, we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found in our ministry. Um, This is something that I think is honestly really important because I would say one of the biggest obstacles to coming to Christ is Christians. Um, Christians can be jerks. Christians can be mean. Christians can put off. uh, When Honestly, when you think of the most judgmental people in your life, I think of Christians. Um, and, And Chris... Welson talked about this the other night on a Wednesday night, uh, and it was it was a really awesome discussion that we had. And it, 
this idea that so much of what we do in life, because we are ambassadors for Christ and we're his earthly representatives, that when we are jerks to people, they're going to think, why do I want to go to that church? Why do I want to believe in Jesus? Why would I like to be like these people, this group that meets every week? They can go to church two, three times a week and still be mean, still be full of unforgiveness and bitterness and anger and, and judgmental and think they're way better than us. Don't be an obstacle. Paul said, we put no obstacle in anyone's way. Guess what? The gospel is going to be an obstacle. The Bible did say that it's going to be a stumbling block because it's free grace. Let the gospel be the only stumbling block. Don't add additional stumbling blocks and say you have to live perfectly just like me, even though I'm not living perfectly or being mean and, and saying all these judgmental things. Don't be the obstacles in other people's way to find Jesus Christ. Christians, honestly, and this is a hard thing to say, Christians can be the biggest stumbling block. And so ask yourself, ask yourself, am I being an obstacle to someone? I think this is a good, a good way to start in, in any of your relationships with your family, your coworkers, with anyone who is within your circle of life. All right, so number one, Christians, we are ambassadors for Christ. Number two, Christians are servants of God. Verse four says, but as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance in afflictions, hardships, and calamities. Now, obviously at different times in history, life's going to be different. No matter what comes your way, if it's a, a, a nation that's turning against you, you believe, um, follow God. Endure no matter what's going on around you. No matter what the afflictions are, no matter if your family turns your back, their back on you, no matter if your coworkers do not like you because of your faith, your children or your parents do not like you or do not love you. No matter what afflictions or hardships or earthly calamities you go through, a Christian as a servant of God is characterized by endurance. Verse 5 continues this on, right? Beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. Out of all those, I've never been imprisoned, but when I am hungry... I feel like sometimes my Christianity gets switched off. You ever feel like that? When you're hangry and, and, and it's been a while, you, maybe you skipped a meal or you, whatever the case is, it's very easy. What is that acronym? HALT. When you're hungry, when you're alone, when you're um, I keep angry. There we go. Um, the, you know, the, there's these ideas of when you put yourself in certain situations, it's very easy for you to um, not be yourself, right? That's the general idea. And, and here Paul is saying, no matter what's going on in your life, have you been beaten? Maybe by Christians, maybe by who knows? Paul was beaten in a lot of different cities. He was stoned, right? So he's saying, even if you are imprisoned for your faith, even if there are riots against you, no matter what's going on, even if it's a sleepless night and if you've missed sleep, it's very easy to be cranky, right? I know I am. When you don't go with proper sleep, you can wake up the next day and turn your anger on everyone and spew whatever you think and whatever's on your mind. As a Christian, be a servant of God even when you're tired, even when you're hungry. Verse 6, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, and verse 7 going on, by truthful speech and the power of God with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. So Christians are not supposed to just be characterized by things they don't do, but also be characterized by things they do, right? So like, you know, if you're thrown into a prison or have a sleepless night or hungry, yes, follow God. Yes, be pure in your relationships and don't sleep around, right? But also be patient. Be patient with people who are mean to you. Be kind to those that are your enemy. You are characterized by having the Holy Spirit. Remember, 
that you get to be an ambassador for Christ, but also with God. God is residing in you. You have the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and so you can, because God's love has been shined in your heart, you can show that real and genuine love towards others. And, and, and honestly, what I think verse 6 is getting at when it talks about real and genuine love is not the fake plastic love that you can sometimes get on a Sunday. I can say hello to you. I can greet you at the door. I can even give you a hug and say, welcome to Redeeming Grace Church. And that's not experiencing the real genuine love that God wants a, a congregation to have, that God wants his family to have. There's so much more that we can give and show, and we can invite people over to our hearts or, or into our lives and, and, and experience life with them and have meals with them and become friends with them and, and, and help them as they help us with our own issues. As Christians, God desires us to be a part of one another's lives. And this is what Paul was going through. Paul was going through all these different imprisonments and beatings, and yet at the same time, he was spending his life with other believers, sharing the gospel with them, sharing truth, right? I, I love this idea in, in verse 7, by truthful speech and by the power of God with weapons, weapons of righteousness. No matter what was going on with Paul, right? they, they just wanted Paul to preach a little differently. He, he was talking about, you know, in, in, when you read the book of Acts uh, on the Mars Hill or in different areas, and he would preach that Jesus is the only way, that there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And that's what irked them because it wasn't a very tolerant message. It was saying, essentially, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell forever. And all the other religions didn't like it. And then the people who were creating idols didn't like it because they started to lose business when all the people started turning to God. And Paul would not change his message. His message was truthful regardless of what was going on in the circumstances, in the countries around him. He was not going to give the truth of the gospel. He was not going to sway. He was not going to compromise it. He was going to speak the truth. And he did that in God's power with weapons of righteousness, which if you remember in Ephesians chapter 6, it's prayer. It's the word of God. It's the breastplate of righteousness, right? We have all these different things that God has given us that we can wake up every day and put on and live our life with. Now verse 8 says, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true. Um, I don't know about you, but this is one of the things that irks me the most. When someone, um, as the kids say nowadays, when someone disses me, when, when you are dishonored in life, especially as a man, that affects me a lot. I want to not deal with you ever again if you disrespect me, whether it's at my job or, or wherever, or at my house, Sometimes when my kids disrespect me, it irks me. Um, this is something that Paul says, no matter what's going on, even if you are honored, even if the church is going great and, and people are coming to God and things are going great, or if you are dishonored and the culture doesn't like you and they, they dishonor you because you're a Christian, or you're dishonored in your home by your spouse, by your family, whoever dishonors you, still follow God. No matter if you are slandered or if you are praised, or if you are treated as an imposter, or is true, follow God. Whether you are, verse 9, unknown or well-known, this is the idea of it doesn't matter how many likes or followers you have on Facebook, Instagram, or Snapchat, or whatever you use nowadays. It doesn't matter if you are well-known. It says, as dying we be and behold, we live, even if your physical body is hurting and in pain and you are dying or on your deathbed. Because of Christ, you live. Paul went through a lot in his life. More than I think a lot of us being stoned and beaten and left for dead and bitten by snakes and shipwrecked. And yet, he says things like he does in verse 10 that always astound me. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. As poor, yet making many rich. As having nothing, yet possessing everything. 
Paul had sorrowful days. They weren't all, he didn't have this Mary Jane attitude or this, um, this blissful mentality of only think positive thoughts. No, he said, even if you are having sorrowful thoughts, even if you are having a bad day, you can always rejoice because your joy is centered on God, not your circumstances. Even if you are poor and you can't make a house payment or a car payment or there are issues in your life because you are poor, or even if you are rich, follow God, right? Because as Christians, ultimately, we understand that through Christ, eternally, spiritually, we possess everything. Even if this life is bad. Verse 11, he says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted in your own affections. In return, I speak to you as children, widen your hearts also. He's saying, I want to talk to you guys. I want to be real for a moment. I want to open up my heart. This is one of those sit-down family conversations. And he's saying, you guys are not being restricted by me, Paul, or by the apostles, even though that there are people in your church that are attacking me, Paul. He's saying, you guys are actually restricted in your own affections, your own love. You're being restricted. And he's saying, widen your hearts. And I would say that same thing to all of us today, to you guys and to myself, that we all need to widen our hearts because we are restricted in our own, our own affections. I'm already over. That's because we had communion, right? Um, Let's finish up real quick. Verse 14 and on. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So number one, Christians are ambassadors. Number two, Christians are servants. Number three, Christians are the temple of God. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Most of the time, people use this in context like with Samson, you shouldn't marry a non-believer. If your lives are going in different directions, it's actually just not practical to do that. It's not a good thing. It, when oxen are yoked, let's say you put a donkey and an oxen together, they're going to go in different directions. So they're going to buck at each other and it's not going to work very well, right? He's saying if you are following Christ and going in the direction of Christ, be yoked with believers. Now, it's honestly the primary interpretation, I would say, is not marriage, though that's an application that works. Um, so if you're dating someone, don't date a non-believer. Um, but I would say the primary interpretation is actually bad teachers. Don't listen to bad teachers that are taking you away from Christ, that are restricting your afflictions, that are, um, in his case specifically, saying that Paul is not an apostle and don't listen to Paul. In your life, it's very easy to listen to uh, Christian pastors or teachers online, on YouTube, on a podcast that tell you whatever you want to hear, whatever you want to do in your life. And you get a teacher that agrees with you. And eventually you formulate a God that is just a version of yourself rather than the true God, which sometimes disagrees with your, th your thoughts. And there's a deeper spiritual reality, though, that's going on in this case, because what he says here is, verse 15, what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Right? So when you understand this, this deeper uh, issue that's going on, he uses the word uh, symphony or harmony that Christ does not have with Belial. And Belial is another ancient name for Satan or the accuser or a demon lord. Um, this, this idea that you can invite bad theology into a church and it's like inviting satan into the church and, and that's why correct biblical teaching is so important because wrong teaching can send your life off a wrong path and 50 years down the line you'll be way off into left field if you understand that we are the temple of god and we are not to be mixing ourselves with idols I love what he says here, though, as he quotes the Old Testament, Isaiah 52 and Ezekiel chapter 20. He says, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you 
and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. So we are supposed to be different and act different. Growing up, this was taught to me to be like, you need to dress differently than the world, and you need to wear a white shirt and a suit and tie. And I was like, mm, that's not what God is actually talking about here. It's not talking about your outward appearance, right? He's saying he's, he's making you a new heart. And so because of that, you are supposed to be different. Like the Israelites were different than the nations around them in how they ate and how they dressed and stuff like that. There was this, this, this mentality of let's be different to tell people that we are God's people. And in the same way, our actions that come from a changed heart are supposed to be different. When one of us suffers as Christians, we are to widen our affections and love them and help them in a way that's foreign to the nation around us. We are to out-love them and in our love be separate than the world. Also, we are to not touch the unclean. We are not to be sleeping around. We are not to be living a life full of sin and reveling in it and saying, oh, it's no big deal and minimizing sin. We are supposed to be different in that way as well. Ultimately, though, holiness is not just about not doing things, but it's also about dedicating ourselves to a relationship with God. I love this. He ends verse 18. It says, Father, he wants to be a father to us, to his sons and daughters. He wants to adopt us into his family. We are his kids. And he actually ends this whole thought with chapter 7 and verse 1. He says, since we have these promises from the Old Testament on these, these last few verses, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of the body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. So cleanse yourself from every defilement that is tripping you up today. God desires you to be active and vigorous in your role in changing. Now is the time to follow God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you teach us that we are your temple. We are your family. We are your ambassadors. We are your servants. You love us like a father. And we are your children. Help us to change, change our lives and not put that change off for another week or another month in the future, but change now, change today. That we give up our sins and follow you and repent and love you with all of our being, our heart, soul, mind, and strength. In the name of Jesus, amen.